we're into round seven already. Things are rattling along much, much quicker today than they were yesterday. And with me to describe it, round seven is Gia, who appears not to be able to hear me. Okay, cool. So I'm going to assume that Gia uh, can't hear me at this point. I'll have a quick talk about what's going to happen in round seven. We're going to see a bunny hopper taking on Levick. Uh, Bunny Hopper is six and zero. Oh, Levick is only five and one, and that's obviously a big difference. Bunny Hopper with a, a loss in hand. Levick, not so much. See the lineups there. Levick, we we know about Bunny Hopper. I'm not going to talk about Bunny Hopper too much for the moment. Let's talk about Levick. It's his big chance to show us who he is. Um, he was first. So he was first in ladder as we sort out the tech issues there, my fault entirely probably, in April and May at various points, first to reach Legend. He got a huge win percentage in Battle Riff and also has the highest win percentage pretty much in all the qualifiers. Oh, I'm so glad I can hear you now. I thought it was going deaf, but yes, it is very good to be on it for my first cast of the day, and it is going to be a banger of a match. I'm sure you are singing the praises of Bunny Hopper, of course, one of the most storied players in Europe, and with a lineup that I feel is largely just some of the most expected in the meta. Nothing too out of the ordinary there. I'm curious to see him perform particularly on Highlander Hunter, because I remember around this time last year when Midrange Hunter was a deck, he was the main proponent of that archetype. Yeah, Bunny Hopper, of course. I don't know, I was going to say, of course, sort of setting up for the GMs. We haven't seen the GMs do that great in recent Masters Tours, but with Eddie and Bunny Hopper up there this time, they're, they're fighting back somewhat, the GMs, I think. Yes, I think that it would take a couple more rounds to truly see. Uh, but I guess in the previous top eight, there was just one GM in Yanchaping, which is Monsanto. But there's a lot more potential. I'm thinking also, aside from Bunny Hopper, Derek was mentioning Alutemu in with a 6 0 standing, and Blyce, who is technically already a GM, even though we haven't seen him in the Grandmaster circuit, has that chance. But of course, on the flip side, there's always the story of the new and up and comers. Levick is a name that I have to admit I'm not particularly familiar with but to have made it this far is no mean feat in a field this um this skilled and to have to fight against bunny hopper it's definitely gonna be sort of a david and goliath story but i think levick can prove so much if he manages to take the series yeah levick actually has pretty good ladder stats and qualifier stats and such like going on um, first to Legend in May, and also very, very early on got Rank 1 Legend in April. Qualified through ladder, I think. And I say I think because he has um, a 68% win rate in best of threes over 100 plus qualifiers. So he just kills these sort of the tier two events, the events we don't really get to see, the ones that lead into this. Uh, but right. this is his big chance to show that he can do it against one of the best players in the world, depending how highly you want to go with one of the, because some people will say he's the best player in the world, I suspect. Wow. Um, I think that is a very valid opinion. And you bring up a great point about how the Masters Tour qualifiers have the best of three format compared to the actual Masters Tours, which tend to be best of five. And there is a lot of lineup preparation philosophy that differs in there and i think it's really a test of skill whereas i'd say in some aspects performing well in qualifiers is as much a test of skill as a test of just endurance and mental stamina and so we're heading first into a demon hunter versus quest lock matchup this is not the usual demon hunter used to seeing from levick it is more in the realm of the late game package he's got the magtherodon in there he's got horde pillager to re-equip Aldrashi Wardblades, and just, all in all, a lot of control tools. Yeah, very similar, but not the same as the deck we just saw from Eddie. Um, played quite well, or played incredibly well, as he's the designer in the previous round. Um, but other things going on in this, like the um, Sightless Watcher, for instance, that Levick has in here. 
yes, that could help him a lot in smoothing out the curve, even though it is just a one of copy. I think the deck heavily relies on card draw to getting that big combo with Megtheridon on. And the timing of it is also extremely important. Megtheridon, I would say, is just the most threatening card in this matchup, but you can't play it all willy nilly. Um, if you expect your opponent to still have a big Moarg clear on it available, or a Keladon, or even Twisting Nether, it can make quick work of that. And that's a problem because you don't have many tools to force those cards out of the Warlock's hand. Mm -hmm. So you're looking to get it down when they're not going to be able to deal with it, but somehow you have to force them to use up those things, or they're just going to have them in their hand the whole game and they, you'll never be able to play the Magtheridon yes. down. And in other matchups, I do think that Magtheridon um, is the win condition. Just being able to swing the board and stick a 12-12, I'd say, is very problematic for classes like Hunter and possibly Rogue if they're not running the Blackjack Stunner package. Against Quest Warlock, though, they have that removal that, you, as you said, is not going to be forced out all that early. So I think uh, Levick also needs to be thinking about maximizing his damage from the weapons. There's the Warglaives in there, and of course, ways to buff it. Twin Slice is a big one, and generate more buffs with that Vulpera Scoundrel. And you already see him committing the Magtheridon on Curve, knowing that there's no way for Bunny Hopper to bounce back these 1-3s or transform them, whereas other decks might be able to have that possibility. Yeah, and taking the chance that maybe Bunny Hopper doesn't have the ways to deal with it this early, whereas later on maybe Bunny Hopper would have. Uh, he knows the chances are quite slim, but if it does stick, it's two turn lethal, so give it a go. Right. And being able to get it online as early as turn 5, I'm sure Levick is eyeing this Chaos Nova to follow up, clear the board, and Bunny Hopper can't ca uh, safely one. develop a minion into that. And uh, rather, I think Bunny Hopper's priority is to make sure he has a way to answer that 12 12. And for now, he has the Moarg Nether Breath, but that's only 8 damage. Um, with the Blood Mage Thalnos, it's also a little bit short, even if he's able to coin out all three of those cards on the follow up. And the problem for the Warlock is not so much accumulating the ways to kill it, but it's turn 4. Like, right. it doesn't matter if you've got all the cards in your hand if you can't play them all. So he really needs to set some of that up immediately. So he's playing the Thanos now, just so it's on board, ready for next turn. I mean, it is going to get cleared after the Megtheridon deals with all of those minions and just the Chaos Nova normal effect. The big problem with using the coin there is that he does not leave himself available for six mana. I think the reasoning for Sense Demons from Bunny Hopper there was to fish for the second Moarg, which upon seeing that he didn't get it, he is now just playing the coin to make sure he doesn't overdraw. But the thinking was if he gets Moarg, he would have Moarg, Moarg, Nether Breath to deal 16 damage. And it comes off the top, but now the coin isn't available. That's a huge problem. It really is. It was also some protection from Blade Dance there. Um, having the five minions right. out instead of the, the four would just give a chance of Blade Dance at least failing. So that's another reason to have thrown it out there. Yeah, so very good point. But now, Bunny Hopper does not have a way to deal with this 12 12, and Levick knows it. After having seen the coin, there's not even a possibility for the coin Keladon. Uh, and so, Bunny Hopper, it feels like it's just going to have to face tank this 12 damage and then clear on the following turn. The plot twist, while it looks very juicy on this hand, would be giving up his guaranteed clear onto the morgue when he hits six mana. So, I feel like this turn might even just be a crazed Netherwing tempo play. Yes, it's going to be painful, but he is going to heal a lot of that back up with the three card combo next turn. Yeah, if not all of it, there's a good mm. chance. So, Levick has to proceed as if Bunny Hopper can't deal with it, I feel. Just try and deal with the 5 5, keep Bunny Hopper on the back foot, and just make sure that Bunny Hopper can't kill it. Don't give him any chance to kill it. Right, you mentioned dealing with the 5-5, five five, which at first glance looks very in enticing, right? Because if you leave the 5 damage up, suddenly it just needs a single Soul Fire or Nether Breath to deal with the Magtheridon. But if Levick were to spend the turn going Chaos Strike I beam to deal with that, he's foregoing the Skull on Curve. And so I think um, he is obviously rewarded with the outcome of the draw, being able to still deal with the K uh, Crazy Netherwing with his discounted spells. But even had he not hit 
a removal, I still like him leaving up the 5-5 to keep his game plan going. Yeah, we saw earlier it's very hard for the Demon Hunter to get a foothold on the board, so that makes sense to me now you describe it to me. Um, obviously, he can't expect this. It's just Hearthstone happening to him right now. Um, but what we saw earlier is when the Warlock does get that foothold, the Demon Hunter runs out of game plan quite quickly. Right. Uh, it is a very welcome draw for Lovick, though the Warglaves with the hero power allows him a very clean clear onto the board and he can push face. Although, you don't really want to be spending all those weapon charges on minions, especially since now Lovick's game plan A has been answered very conveniently by Bunny Hopper, who's now on full health. I think he wants to save every last weapon charge for burst damage at this point, and he can easily take advantage of these bulwarks by using the Malachian Aura for the clear. Sightless Watcher, <laughs> not just being used to have a look at the top of the deck, but also just as something on the board. One mm -hmm. thing you can do as the Demon Hunter here is by at least getting things on the board, try and restrict Bunny Hopper's hand size a bit. Obviously one Sightless Watcher is not enough, but at least it's contributing. Definitely is. I think Levick's main game plan is just going to be able to survive and eke out the damage with the Warglaves. But this deck is not the same as the old OTK Demon Hunter where it happens, well, all in one turn. It has to be incremental damage, lots of swings with the Warglaves, only one of them being able to go face per turn. And yes, he can uh, recommit more charges with his Horde Pillager, but if you deal that damage too slowly, A, the Quest Warlock will probably have their quest completed and start putting the pressure on you. And B, they can just heal in small amounts every single turn as well. Granted, we have seen both Moarg used, but the Aranasi Broodmothers are there, the second Nether Breath is there as well. There is, of course, the double Volpera Scoundrel. Do you think um, Levick will be looking to get huge amounts of damage from there, perhaps? I would definitely wager that thought. Uh, Inner Demon, probably. Uh, stealth, one of the best cards in the matchup, even if it's slow. It, the damage just doesn't get there because if you look at the deck as a whole from Levick, it is a control deck trying to get there against a combo deck, which is, you know, historically not a very favorable thing to do. But if he's looking for the outs, it's going to have to be from some extra damage generated here and there. Uh, that plot twist from Bunny Hopper may just give him one thing you do need in that matchup is for the, the combo deck to have to go slow. And drew all of his nine drops from that plot twist. So maybe Levick will at least get a little bit of time to assemble some sort of threat. Yeah, you bring up a very good point. And it's not, uh, notably, it's not just all the nine drops. A bunch of the burst spells are also in hand and unable to be discounted at this point. Granted, Bundy Hopper did hit the zero cost second nether breath, which is huge. But we've seen the first Reign of Fire and both Soul Fire in hand. So uh, Bunny Hopper's burst potential beyond what's already in hand is very limited. Um, we're looking at Zephyrus and. Uh, Chris Netherwing is the other one, and he's discounted that as well. So suddenly, not very limited. My bad. Yeah, but it was limited at the time he started the sentence, <laughs> at the very least. And you know, Levick does have some minions in the deck. He does have his own Zephyrs. He does have those Volpiras. And he does have the Skull. Maybe he'll try and clear room for that Skull next turn just by emptying the left-hand side of that handout. Oh, it does feel bad to play the Horde Pillager for not much value, but I do agree that the Skull needs to get some work done, and you don't want to be dumping Sephiris for that purpose, because it is also another source of burst. For Bunny Hopper there, he was thinking, of course, till the end of the rope to see whether he wants to play the crazed Netherwing to not overdraw and also create some more board presence. Yes, it limits his one-turn burst potential, but I think it makes a lot of sense to give him a better position on board and also free up the hand in case he draws Zephyrus. So we talked about that inner demon, but Levick, because the board state was unable to take it there, having to take a uh, board to clear instead. So that's mm -hmm. one chance to get damage in hand ruined, but he's actually starting to get the damage across on the board. Bunny Hopper slowly but surely down to 16 here. Yeah, it is starting to get a little scary for Bunny Hopper. Um, the one Aranasi has been drawn and the other was played. And so the healing is actually limited uh, just to that. this Nether Breath and the natural Alex Draza, I suppose. But I don't think Levick will be putting Bunny Hopper within a range close to zero, but not zero because of the fear of that Alex Draza. And Bunny Hopper is saying, 
I probably don't have enough heal to outlast this uh, Demon Hunter deck. So he is going to go on the offensive instead, oh, set up for the Malagos burst, which is already in hand. 18 yeah. points of damage available on the next turn. And just having the 8-8 eight, eight is also a really big deal, as it turns out, this mm -hmm. time around. Even though it's a controlling deck, Levick not really equipped with the answers right now. Yeah, having used the Blade Dance is a very big deal here. And now Bunny Hopper presents this board state where you definitely have to heal, but a single I Beam does not get you out of range of the Malagos, Soulfire, and Nether Breath. And if you heal with the Aldraki Ward Blades, that is going to take a lot of. Um, sorry, it's going to take a lot of the mana up and leave less room to deal with the Alexstrasza. And so it has to be the specific combination of the Moorg on the other side for burst healing to actually get Levick out of range. Yes, yeah, and it has managed to get a board out of it as well. So I think his only decision here really is what to do with his second slice. Yeah, if he's playing very scared, he could go for the Aldraki and heal further up out of range. But at that point, we need to start thinking about breakpoints. So if you go Aldraki Hero Power, he goes up to 24, which is still within range of three spells if he expects that three uh, more than one of the cards has been discounted with Malagos. Yeah, he'd need to get to 25 to avoid that, which would yeah. be a big deal. But staying above 18 is kind of the layman's way to do this when you... Mm -hmm when you don't have to factor in too many combinations as your opponent right. has a 10 card hand. And there was that option to go above 25 if he wanted to commit his second slice as well, but that did seem like a lot of resources used. It is a Warglaves that is overrided and damage that's not immediately threatening Bunny Hopper as well. So I think Levick here has found a pretty good middle ground of putting himself out of range of some combinations of spells, but also giving himself lethal outs on the backswing. And now Bunny Hopper, despite not having lethal, feels threatened enough by what Levick has presented that he's actually tempoing out his Malogos here and using it for burst healing. Burst healing. I mean, it's correct. It's just a phrase that I've not heard used before. It's superb. <laughs> All the way back up to, you know, Jackson amounts of healing, as I would probably right. call it and goes on the offensive himself, but he's having to do it the hard way with all these non-reduced cards. This feels somewhat like a freeze mage mirror, except the fireballs have turned into either soul fires or weapons on either end, but there has been limited board interaction in terms of attacking. It's all been removal spells. And I think it was really good recognition from Bunny Hopper that he himself was not at a safe life total. And if he commits one soul fire, he's still... Um, uh, despite not necessarily having burst lethal on the next turn with the other soul fire, should his Malagos be cleared, he has a follow up of possibly Dragon Queen Alex Straza. Yeah, this might just come down to Dragon Queen versus Dragon Queen at this rate because <laughs> Levick has the Consume Magic. He also has his own Zephyrs active. So that's his Dragon Queen, unfortunately for him. It's right. not quite as good. Um, yeah, and they're is a Zephyrus on the other side. Well, of course, the Malagos right here is an immediate problem. He could just silence it, but that doesn't negate the poor natural attack that it has. So Levick is going to clear this off the hard way with the Blade Dance as well. It's committing a lot of his uh, resources, which I think he's just banking on Bunny Hopper not immediately having an active Dragon Queen this turn. But unfortunately, it is there. Yeah, and this is twice we've seen this match today, and it just looks really difficult for the Demon Hunter. Levick's had a mm -hmm. lot of answers, and he's not even close to being in this. He did have that early start that could have gone his way, but That's that right. seemed to be the only chance, really. Yeah, Bunny Hopper piecing together the answer for the Magtheridon and also healing up. Speaking of healing, an Amber Watcher as well to add another nail to the coffin. Uh, but yeah, the fact that he was able to deal with the 12-12 early on and also negate any of the face damage it dealt was huge. And from then on, if you just line up the resources in each deck card for card, even if Bunny Hopper's list does not include an Acidic Swamp Ooze, there is just far more value in the quest lock deck. 
even if all of those dragons are not discounted, they are just expensive and threatening minions to play on curve that Levick has to find a way to deal with. And unfortunately, Levick's last answer is this Zephyrus, at which point Bunny will respond with his own Zephyrus into possibly a Tyrion, and that could close out the game in the near future. Yeah, he's, he's done pretty well to get this far, but it just seems inevitable he's out of stuff now. And Waxedra doesn't help. Like any vague patient. hopes he had is actually really irritating for him. <laughs> it's true. Okay, going for the Shadow Word Ruin here, I assume. A nice optimization there. Perhaps a player on panic mode would just think and tunnel vision into Twisting Nether, but this is a way for Levick to get a little bit more damage in and the board presence alongside the board clear. He uses the Consume Magic also to make sure that Waxedra doesn't come back turn after turn, but I think he knows that the writing's on the wall. Yeah, I think so too. That Consume Magic, by the way, looks like a good card in the meta suddenly. We've seen it used a couple of times today to very strong effect. When you can There's... get the outcast value, it does just seem very strong compared to the priest card silence. Um, it's definitely a card mm. that you wouldn't feel awful about being generated, but I just think that if it's coming off of Vulpera Scoundrel, Cobalt uh, Spellkins, you would just end up considering, I wish this was a twin slice. Yeah, and he's actually gone with the Watcher and not the Spellkin in this version. That's the main mm -hmm. difference, I think. So. Maybe he just got sick of getting not twin slice, even though it's a one in three chance. Come close and burn. Looks like I'm here just in time. Just easy redevelopment for Bunny Hopper. He knows that there are no more minion threats left uh, for Levick. At least nothing substantial. There might be the other Vulpera or a Moarg, for example, but there is just not enough juice in the deck, not enough weapon charges that can come down immediately and so bunny hopper does not feel pressured to go for the zephyrus immediately this is still a threatening board state in and of itself you say this moa can't get it done is what you're saying it's not going all the way for 29. sadly on its own it can't quite get there two moargs can deal with a 12 12 but one moarg can't deal with a couple four sixes and a keladon unfortunately that's just how math works yeah it just doesn't seem fair they just work better in I teams. Grow impatient. Mm -hmm. Just like casters, Lorinda. Ah. Uh, it's yeah, really no. difficult to cast when one of us is muted, you know? Yeah, I mean, I couldn't hear a word you were saying. It was fantastic. Because not only was I muted, but I also got it silenced. So that made oh, it no. more confusing. I wasn't saying anything <laughs> because I didn't know if I was going to talk over you or not and how to respond. <laughs> wow. Imagine if I just tried responding and... in just based on an inference of what you were saying. You could have held up a piece of paper or something and saying, Linda, <laughs> you're an idiot, for goodness sake. You're not that old. You can operate a computer. You could have said, oh, I have to cast with Gia. It's a terrible day. And then I just would have piped in and said, yeah, I completely agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would have got you talking. Meanwhile, we're having to talk now because um, Bunny Hopper's being very precise and Levick's not giving it up. And I like to see this. I actually like right. to see players fighting on. Because um, I, I feel that Bunny Hopper likes to let his style intimidate players who haven't played him much. Yeah, I can see there's a chance for immediate lethal, but involves the chance of Soulfire discarding Zephyrus if he got in Soulfire first and then Gore Howl. But apparently, Zephyrus still just gives Gore Howl in this situation, even before playing the Soulfire. That's a good boy right there. Yep, uh, Zeph is still capable of behaving himself, apparently. I know that people complain that Zeph doesn't understand them, but, you know, I complain that people don't understand me. That's my fault, not theirs. <laughs> so I think they're, they're blaming true. the wrong person if they're blaming Zeph and not themselves. I do need to spend a couple more hours on the What Does Zephyrus Give Here website. I have not practiced enough, but that is going to be a very clean game one to Bunny Hopper. It definitely feels like the climax of the matchup happened 
around turn six when the mm. Magtheridon got to go face once, but then the answer was there on the other side. And from then on, it was just a matter of optimization from Bunny Hopper. You saw him never overcommit his resources into a big blade dance clear from Levick. And also, Bunny Hopper recognized when Malagos for healing was his best out in the situation. And I think very well played from both sides. Levick didn't get the win, but that is a difficult matchup to begin with. And I think he showed good understanding of his own outs. Yeah, he kept the pressure on, made sure that Bunny Hopper had to keep optimizing. If Bunny Hopper was going to make a mistake, Levick was going to maybe kill him. He got him down to sort of 12, 14 regions. Um, but now we're going to see Bunny Hopper on the deck of the tournament. This, what I always think is a very straightforward deck, Highlander Hunter. But having cast with Raven a couple of times, I realized that there's a lot more to it than it just playing on curve. Yes, uh, it is a lot of the time playing on curve, but when you have to choose between two cards that are on curve, that can be game deciding quite literally. And a lot of it has to do with predicting what your opponent's options are. And I think you brought up a great point about the previous game where Levick was playing to, you know, maybe I can win this if my opponent makes a mistake, which is a very, very valid thing to do that it often works on ladder a lot of the time when people haven't practiced particular matchups enough, but it's just unfortunate when your opponent on the high stakes field is Bunny Hopper, and it's very unlikely they're going to be making rookie mistakes. Now that's actually why I liked it so much, though. It's very easy to play Bunny Hopper and think he's not going to make a mistake, but if you don't give him the chance to make a mistake, he definitely won't. So Correct. make him have that chance. Put him to the test. You know, play to his style, which is don't concede. Make them beat you, and that's what Levick did. It's like... You're not going to intimidate me with your, your slowness and your precision, Bunny Hopper, because I can do it too. Laying okay. down the law, even in losing that first game. Indeed. Levick on his Druid now. And starting off with yet another, uh, I guess, point in the debate I constantly have with Derek over in the APAC region as to whether you should keep removal as Druid. Crystal power when you're on the play, I have always felt is a little bit sketchy, but now that uh, Fungal Fortunes has been nerfed and you don't want to be playing it on your two, or you can't be playing it on your two mana turn anyway, I can see the reason for holding on to a removal spell, especially since he had overgrowth in the opener. But it does mean though that it's less slots in the hand to try and hit that Fungal Fortune for the card draw and get to Glowfly Swarm, which is, I would say, game plan A against Highlander Hunter is getting down an early swarm. Do you feel that maybe with Fortunes now cast, costing three, not two, you have more time to draw it before you have to play it? So you get to look at one extra card that may be keeping Crystal Powers a little bit better? Lorinda, that sounds like a Lorinda question of hard oh, no. maths. Don't, oh, don't no. make me maths it. I'm on break. I'm, I'm enjoying my casting experience. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that is very fair. Um, on instinct, I would say it's still a little bit sketchy because uh, just the idea of you um, giving up an immediate chance at drawing a card for one because you have one extra turn of drawing the card doesn't make sense in my head, but we can hash that out in more detail later on. For now, Bunny Hopper has managed to stick a Misha, I would say the best option in this matchup. Even though Huffer gets immediate damage in the Misha is just so much more durable against things like Crystal Power and uh, Bog Beam later on. And this to me is where Hearthstone is fun to watch and sometimes hard to play. Like, everything in me is just screaming, just play the Griffin, it's not going to die. But he doesn't know that, of course. <laughs> Yeah, he's got to make sure that it's okay to do right. so, but this is actually monstrously good for Bunny Hopper that this 4-1 is going to live. Yeah, I mean, in a lot of cases, you kind of can see, you know, okay, just a Moonfire can deal with this, but Bunny Hopper didn't have any other options, and that's when Highlander Hunter is pretty easy to play, when you only have one green card in the hand. And um, even if it dies, it still manages to help him cycle, and then he can follow up with probably one of the most threatening cards in the matchup, Evasive Fey Wing. For the amount of mana you spend and on the turn it comes down, it just gets a lot of damage in there because it can't be targeted by those removal spells. Another big question here for Bunny Hopper though, of how many of these two twos to remove? He can pick any number from zero to three. They're all available to him. Um, obviously, but inserting damage into your opponent's face is a big deal. However, he will be terrified of Mount Seller next turn, so I assume he'll try and make sure he can deal with a Mount Seller should it turn up. And if we're thinking about preemptive answers, or rather 
pre-developing a board state that has the most attack to deal with Mount Cellar. You might think evasive failing is the gut reaction, but with this play of Zixor, it actually allows Bunny Hopper the option to not necessarily trade off his Griffin. I do think though he is just taking the safest um, set of trades and make sure that he's not punished by a Savage Roar in particular because the four health minions get very, very easily traded off by that one buff spell. And Levick making a pretty interesting play here. Um, not going for the Mount Cellar Iron Bar, which would have been alright, but that was so weak to Rot Nest and such like. Right. Mm -hmm. That he is just setting up a much better turn. Look how yeah. next turn's going to be, Jia. Right. Even though it's painful to heal up Bunny Hopper's minions back to full, I think it is a very, very worthy investment because Levick has picked up just the juice, three procs minimum on the next turn. And Bunny Hopper's mm -hmm. best development in response to that is the Fey Wing. And it is a little bit off curve, but uh, I don't see any value in a Bone Wraith before you've even seen the threat. Yeah, that seems fair. It's not going to really exert any pressure. And mm -hmm. that is something that Bunny Hopper urgently needs. So I can definitely get behind this Fey Wing. And even Bunny Hopper doesn't need to go to rope on that one. Oh, a fourth proc on this turn. This is dirty. And there's possibilities for Griffins and Zixors on this side too, completely picking the board apart. There is, but he, he did need this. Like, there's a lot of damage coming in. So although it's nasty, he needs at least one of these to go reasonably well, which of course it should. So always a small question of how to distribute the damage. Um, if you are thinking about the Zixor possibility, I half expected to see both of the Moonfires drop onto Misha, but uh, it's very low odds to actually get an actual Rusher on that yeah, specific get... proc. Yeah, it, even to get a, a Rusher or a Taunt at all with those four <laughs> procs is 71%, but that's half the time of that is the Taunt, of course. So not as great as it seems. I think it's 43% on all four procs, not just a specific one, to get mm -hmm. the Russia. And so he parceled out the damage a little bit more, thinking about the possibility of generating the three attack minions like Weaponized Wasp. And uh, it's a small optimization there, but I think the more important part about how that turn was parceled out is that he put the taunts on the most durable minions that were not Mount Cellar. And so making things difficult for Bunny Hopper to actually clear the 5-8. And uh, yeah, this is not looking great for Bunny Hopper. I don't see a way to actually get through to the Mount Cellar. And that means that the same is coming next turn. Yeah. And if you've ever wondered what tempo means in Hearthstone, these taunts say it's all. He could have taunted up the Mount Cellar and played another one next turn, but then he wouldn't have the tempo of being able to play the two spells should this one get reached. So this is what tempo is all about, and you're going to see the, the extreme case in actually of how it finishes the game. Bunny Hopper just playing what he can, but I'm pretty sure he knows that he's in a terrible spot here. If Levick gets any measure of further spells and fungal fortunes, is exactly that. I sometimes wonder if he does know if he's in a terrible spot. I sometimes just think that he looks at each board state with a cold, calculating precision, doesn't even understand the difference between like good and bad. He just <laughs> does what is best from here. Okay, I can say from personally talking to Bunny Hopper that he does recognize when <laughs> things are going badly for him. But what makes him a great player is that he can look beyond that, as you said, and evaluate what's my 1% or 0.5% out here. And right now I'm looking at that out to be a top deck Zephyrus to even survive the next turn. And even yeah. after that, it's kind of a question mark because there's a second Mount Cellar, there's Ysera, yeah. And that's where Levick's played as well. He's had the draw to be able to do the good things, but he's made a couple of choices. He played the Glowflies with only three of them, for instance. That was one choice mm -hmm. he made that slowed down the attack. And he also made that choice to play the Overflow rather than uh, a solitary Mount Cellar with one proc. So, and then he made the choice to keep the second one in reserve just in case. 
Well, so, I butchered... this looks straightforward, yeah. it's been quite yeah. easy. Yeah. Indeed. I butchered my Savage Roar math yesterday, but definitely two Roars and the Power of the Wild are going to get there this time. Levick wasting no time whatsoever. And I think this is the minimum courtesy you can do as a Druid player that hits the absolute nuts is just don't make your opponent suffer any longer. Yep. Just a one, one. And traditionally, that is a matchup, I would say, that is slightly favored in the Realm of the Druid. And it's because, of course, when you hit the overgrowth into Mount Cellar Curve, you're favored in pretty much any matchup. Uh, it's not very often, though, that just the Glowfly game plan can also get there. So I'm not able to hear Gia. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, we are having... Quite a few technical issues yet again. Sorry about that, guys. But we will just go to a quick break while the players set up for game three. Don't go anywhere. Okay, we're good. We're ready for that game number three in this crucial match between Bunny Hopper and Levick. Remembering Bunny Hopper is six and zero already. Levick is five and one. So, in the terms of he needs it the most slightly in this zero sum game, you could go with Levick for that. Uh, finely balanced, but Gia, who do you think is going to take it with the remaining decks? The Rogue versus the Demon Hunter being the big difference. Yeah, I do think that I favor um, this Demon Hunter against Bunny Hopper's Rogue in particular because it is of that control variant. Uh, but the Highlander Hunter for Bunny Hopper could be an X factor. And uh, we're not going to see that either of those classes in action just mm. yet because it is going to be the Highlander Hunter Mirror a matchup that I, as a degenerate, really enjoy, honestly. Even though this deck seems like the decisions are very straightforward, I feel like in this matchup in particular, you need to be so cognizant of what your opponent's best play on that turn can be, and sometimes you adjust your best play accordingly. Yeah, something I've heard said about this, I think there's one or two cards difference. Um, Frizz, by the way, on Levick's side. Uh, mm -hmm. What I've heard said about this is there aren't that many decisions, but you better get them right. Because if it you make a bad decision, true. you are so dead. I feel that a lot of those crucial decisions happen around the turn 7 mark when Siamat and of course Dino Tamer Brand are available options. And in most other matchups, your instinct is if you have Brand on 7, you just jam that and send it face. But a lot of the time in this matchup, if you do that and you don't actually have um, the right or license to do so, as I might put it, like let's say your opponent's board state was too threatening, that can be your downfall. Going to be also interested to see how they use their Zephyrus. My gut instinct is always just to get a wild growth and draw my big things and hit them with it. And then the things you just described aren't a problem because I've got two more mana and you can't deal with it. But you're giving up quite a lot of tempo to do that and also some power later in the game. Yeah, it's interesting you bring up Wild Growth because I hardly take that as an option off Zephyrus in the mirror. I feel that Zephyrus is a very important tempo tool for removal. 
in the matchup because uh, your removal tools for single target minions are uh, pretty limited, aside from Rotten Drake being the premium one, there's Corrosive Breath. Uh, other than that though, you need to maintain a presence on board immediately. Desert Spear is a great way to do that. And we see here from Bunny Hopper that he is just going for the backstab for that tempo. It's not the highest value option, but he recognizes that had he gone for Fairy Dragon and Levick had his own Desert Spear or say Guardian Og Merchant, then he would be falling behind and then the Zephyrus might give marginal benefits later on. <laughs> and amazingly, we're going to see the same play again almost certainly now. <laughs> Um, what if you will defend it with the Orc Merchant? I don't think it really works because Desert Spear is not only because he's got it, but it is the big threat here. And you know, Orc Merchants don't like Desert Spears. Indeed. Desert Spear, if you get to set that up into a Varanus or a Faceless Corruptor, that usually spells doom in the mid game. But we can see Bunny Hopper doesn't have any of those big payoff combos just yet. However, it's nice for him to just develop a spear. Um, and then set up an empty board. I feel like having the reactive tools in the early game is actually very beneficial in this matchup because you get to dictate what the ending board state looks like. And uh, Bunny Hopper's follow-up, even though it is just two three twos, I think that's actually a board state that Highlander Hunter struggles to deal with, especially having used Zephyrus already. Yeah, and that's why Levick is giving this due care and attention. Even though it's a, a very obvious looking play, there are other options always available. Fae Wing would be quite hard to kill, for instance, then you could freeze the face after playing it and Org Merchant it. Certainly worth giving some consideration. Yeah, a very good point, but the downside, I suppose, is having to coin out the Fae Wing means he can't coin out the Rot Nest Drake. Mm -hmm. Uh, and also, the dragon in hand for an eventual Rotnest Drake would be used. And Rotnest is, of course, one of the most powerful swing tools in any matchup, but particularly in the mirror when you expect your opponent to be playing Fey Wings of their own or just one or two big cards on curve. And he does seem to have the better of the curve right now, Levick, but it doesn't at all seem, seem game-breaking in any way. Like you just described, these three twos are going to at least do a decent amount, although the Org Merchant now does get to do its job quite well. So there's also the option of just coining out the Rotness Drake, but because of the ending board state, which is your 4-3, either it trades into the Ooze or the Ooze trades into it on the following turn, and then you end up weak to an opposing Rotness Drake, we see Levick holding off and going for a more efficient option, trying to snipe a higher value target with the Rotness uh, following this turn. So for right now, I guess the uh, kill command is a way to deal with one of the three twos, but it's very awkward because he still just does end up with a four three against a three two. He could coin out that Og Merchant though for a full clear. And I think he might. I think that might be what's going through his head. Uh, the kill command, not the best option if he doesn't do that, I feel. If he does, it looks pretty great. And then he's down a coin. Mm -hmm. And down a coin does feel pretty sad if you can't get to your Siomot soon enough, but a lot of the times in this matchup, Siomot is used as a very efficient removal tool. It's like a Rotness Drake, honestly. Around the same size, removes a big minion and leaves a big minion, but as long as he has Rotness Drake for what he expects to be a big development on Bunny Hopper's side of the board, then I think he's fine delaying his Siomot a bit longer. However, Bunny Hopper doesn't have a big threat on this turn. He conveniently has a pretty good answer for the board state, though. <laughs> yeah, he has about 17 amazing ways to deal with his board, but none <laughs> of them really leave him with a fantastic board of his own. Yep, I think we're probably going to end up seeing a bunch of one-drops uh, land onto the board, and perhaps the Dwarven Sharpshooter ends the turn with Divine Shield. But definitely, I would like to see Bunny Hopper start with the Dwarven Sharpshooter pinging off this Frozen Shadow Weaver. Yep, and I think he may choose to keep all the other stuff in his hand. Unleash for Varanus later on, no. although there is no Nagran Slam in yeah. Levick's deck, which is obviously a big deal for the Unleashed combo. I have to say, it's very few times in the mirror that I actually pull off a Varanus Unleashed combo. I think that the big climax of the matchup happens around turn 7, turn 8, whereas if one person got their 
Dino Tamer or Siamod into the Zixor, game closes out. But yes, there are niche situations where you need that combo to deal with the Alex Straza board in particular. And not only is this a mirror, but the cards they have drawn have been incredibly similar all the way through this. Levick has had yeah. slightly the better of it in that regard, but going second kind of compensates for that. So still really waiting to see that turn seven come up and the do you, don't you see him at guessing game. Quite in the work. Indeed. And Levick not quite happy with how his turn ended up. Um, Just took a damage too much. Yeah. For Bunny Hopper, though, we saw that he ended up saving all of his Desert Spear charges altogether. We could have seen him go a little bit wider and even end the turn with a Scarab on his previous turn, but he prioritized saving that charge later on, I think, um, hoping to draw something a bit more beneficial to combo with it. And there is Varanus, as he said, there's Faceless Corruptor. But now that he's drawn his Storm Hammer, he's using the swings just to get a little bit more board presence. Yeah, it's so irritating when you make a plan like that. Like, yeah, I'm going to look after mm -hmm. my charges. Look at me. And then you just draw the other weapon. It's like, no, now I have to attack every turn. Yeah. It's not what I wanted at all. And we've seen Levick hold on to this Rotnest Drake for a very long time because in his mind, he's not seen a target that is worthy of this very powerful one-time effect. And now it's gotten to the point where he's held on to it for so long but if he doesn't play it this turn or if he doesn't play the Fey Wing, then he doesn't have a good turn and if he plays the Fey Wing, then of course the rot nest isn't necessarily active on the following turn so it's just been awkwardness on both sides and just to point out the very top ends here they both have Varanus, they both have Bran, they both have Siamat but Bunny Hopper does not have Dragon Queen and Levick does not have Nagrand Slam Bunny Hopper's still playing Highlander Hunter without oh. one of the big Highlander cards in the deck. I am shocked. Oh man, yeah, I, really I called noticed. cutting DQA nonsense yesterday when Sato <laughs> talked to me about it, but uh, I feel myself eating my words because it's Bunny Hopper and that means also Casey is doing that. It's still nonsense. You can't cut Dragon Queen in a deck that needs a 10 drop. <laughs> That's what I'm going to say just to be awkward well, and. <laughs> I mean, Dragon Queen is a 10 drop now in most cases, mm -hmm. or in this particular matchup playing a 9 mana 8 8 and nothing else is far too slow. So I guess the reasoning is if you're looking to run into mirrors, then you might as well just run the Grand Slam for mm -hmm. the 10 drop slot. It Anyways, says a but... lot as to the power of the deck if you can drop one of the Highlander cards in a Highlander deck and it's still <laughs> a playable deck. That is a very good point. Well, for this turn, this looks to be a very juicy Siomat target, and it's also Bunny Hopper's only strong play onto the board this turn. But I think he can smell that Levick's been holding on to a bunch of cards. He knows that if there's either Dino Tamer, Siomat, or Rotnest Drake on the other side, he gets very, very punished. So he's actually going to be very very conservative with his resources here and use the smaller minions instead. Gia, this is going to be a fun game of chicken. <laughs> and Levick might win that game of chicken because he does have the three cards in hand, but Bunny Hopper has the time to win that game of chicken because he has the three minions on board already set up. And this kind of goes back to what I was talking about at the very beginning of the matchup where a lot of the time your best play revolves around playing playing around your opponent's best play. And it looks like Levick is going to be the first one to blink and commit a large resource onto the board here. Um, he, as far as I can see it, can't end the turn with the Siomot still having... Divine Shield and um, all the other minions cleared. So he is just going to take um, the best board clearing options available to him right now. But Bunny Hopper will get that big tempo swing that he was saving up for. Yeah, and Levick's Rotness is not active. Let's not forget that. So this Siamat's mm -hmm. going to do its job and it's going to stick. Oh! Surely it's still Siamat here. <laughs> The thing is that we know the Rotness isn't active, but Bunny's got to at least consider that the Rotness might be active. 
It's true, but at least he ends the turn with a Hound there as insurance against Rotness. And more importantly, if he's clearing that with Corrosive Breath and the Storm Hammer, he goes down to 12. And it that, around that health total, I think you get to the point where if you're not pushing your own lethal, it's not worth holding on to the tempo swings anymore because your opponent can start ignoring your board and sending the Hero Power face, um, sending their own Storm Hammer. To face. I guess mm -hmm. it's alleviated slightly by the fact that Zephyrus has been used on both sides, but I definitely prefer that he went for the Siamat now. So, one time in three here, Levitt can just win the game, in my opinion. He can play the Sharpshooter, play Dragon Bane, and shoot the Siamat and hope. Yep. Um, I'm not saying that's the best play, but that's his, that's his baseline play. That's his one in three. I think I pretty much win every time I do this. I do think it is his best play. And not seeing it is going to work out for him more often than not, but I do think it gives him the most percent for the reasons you mentioned. He can also choose to shoot the, the dog, and then if the five misses the seer map, the five that goes face is a lot. Um, but yeah, he's going for it. Oh, oh. That is rough. And Bunny Hopper picks up a dragon, so he can get some face damage in with the corrosive breath. It's not a small thing here, and he can just play the Rotness Drake as a 6-5 after he plays Corrosive Breath, fit in the hero power, get free charges off of the Storm Hammer. It's looking great for Bunny Hopper now. It's just a question of how he wants to trade, if at all. I think you've well, you've got to get rid of the Dragon's Bane, and I think in that regard you want to protect your four health CM mat. You've just seen your opponent make a very desperate looking play to remove it. You know he can't remove it right now, or he would have done. And so, mm -hmm. just make sure it doesn't die. So, you mentioned that option of Corrosive Breath and hit the Dragon Bane, and then send Siamat face, presumably, mm -hmm. which leaves a 5-3. Um, this play clears the entire board, which I think I kind of like this better, even though you are missing 6 immediate face damage, it removes out of Faceless Corruptor on the other side. Unless Bunny Hopper does mm -hmm. not want to trade at all, which I feel is an unnecessary risk, especially since he's seen Desert Spear, Zephyrus, and the Storm Hammer. And, uh, wow, I'm shocked by that. And the but, Dwarven Sharpshooter. So, going this way, though, even if both minions die, he still has lethal with the hero power and the weapon. So, he's oh, challenged Levick yeah. to defend his own face, kill both minions, and still be in the game. That's very true. It would have to involve a taunt and a removal spell. Uh, assuming that the first Dragon Bane shoot even hits the Siamat to begin with. So, in retrospect, especially having seen the Zephyrus, that makes a lot of sense. I like that Netflix making Bunny Hopper kill him here. I just find <laughs> this very amusing and also definitely what Bunny Hopper would do to you, so why not? Never concede, is what you're saying. Never concede you know, against somebody who never concedes. And just in general, I feel like in a Masters Tour, uh, if the actual added time in the matchup is just a couple more seconds, why not? In any case, though, it does mean that the Rogue is the only remaining deck for Bunny Hopper, and I feel it would struggle a little bit against Control Demon Hunter, not having a great way to fend off multiple weapon charges going face. And so I expect to see Levick queue that matchup up first. Although, even Highlander Hunter versus Rogue is not the end of the world for the Hunter. Bunny Hopper was one of the first players to switch to this list, I feel. Um, mm. The really weird, I'm still playing Secrets because Blackjack Stunner's good list, but I want to play Questing Adventurers and make a lot of zero drops. And apparently, yes. this just still works, despite the fact there were the nerfs. Yeah, and uh, you can make the same argument for, well, the stealth package version still works despite the nerfs. And um, you are just trading that additional consistency from the card draw from Greyheart Sage in exchange for the huge tempo potential of Blackjack Stunner. And if we're looking at um, just the heart of the deck, I would say, which is the questing adventurers and Edwin Van Cleef, then it is largely about tempo and going all in and having the cheaper cards on top of that I feel still makes a lot of sense and it's going to be very punishing against Highlander Hunter. Blackjack Stunner is a heck of a card in that matchup. Yeah, the deck that's designed to play on curve suddenly loses its curve and the cards cost more and ugh, it's just not very much fun at all. 
And Bunny Hopper's got the cat and the ambush. That seems to me like a pretty good start. Yes, indeed. There's an argument for not necessarily keeping ambush, but it is mm -hmm. technically just his best play on two mana in this matchup. Um, outside of, you know, coining Miscreant and things in that vein. Yeah, I'm curious to see if he keeps it as well. I can definitely see why you would... I just like the fact that Ambush deals with... It, uh, obviously, it's, that's what it's for. It deals with everything. But against a deck that's trying to play on curve with very efficient stats, Ambush just feels a little bit better than usual to me. For sure. Funny Hopper agrees. And Levick does not have a one drop of its own and that feels very very bad in this matchup where if your opponent even hits the spy mistress on one as a preemptive answer to whatever you put down it feels like you're just going out the gate on the back foot and that is not where hunter wants to be so given this exact hand so forget the ambush exists the rest so of the hand i see that bunny hopper right now has to decide how big he wants his edward to be like that's sort of the whole hand says to me, make a 6-6 six, six Edwin somehow. Step up! It does. And it's available on his three mana turn. Fully expect to see Bunny Hopper just develop. One of the secrets here is going to say immediately ambush. Of course, Dirty Tricks gives him a different option, but I still think ambush is the highest tempo. And then he could go for Edwin alongside Pharaoh Cat on the follow up, or he could delay even longer and set up an Edwin with the lackeys he gets off Miscreant. Curious to see which one he goes for, but there's so many ways for Hunter to deal with things, that, not many ways, but enough ways for it to deal with really big things. He may just go for 6 6. Really like this from Levick, by the way. I see people try and play around Spy Mistress all the time, and the answer is look, it's there, it's been played, right. you can't really play around it efficiently, just get it over with. Correct. And it's very much a bite the bullet type of situation. Yep, the rogues gained one mana on you. Unlucky. That's just how it has to be. Money Hopper just hoping that it's not Animal Companion in particular. That's Levick's on curve play here. He wants Levick to play a natural minion and gets that outcome. And now he's two mana behind. He's dealt with a two drop with a one drop. He's dealt with a three drop oh, with a yeah. two drop. <laughs> When you put it that way, it kind of feels like Bunny Hopper has hit the overgrowth and is <laughs> yeah. just snowballing into his big stats, kind of like a Mount Seller, right, this turn? Yeah, now it goes nuts because he gets to play the 6-6 six, six Edwin should he want to, which he probably does because that seems good to me. The downside of the 6-6 six, six Edwin is that he doesn't necessarily have a good turn 4 play. Uh, that was before he picked up the ambush though. He could just go for a double secrets on the follow-up. It's fine if he doesn't have immediately a miscreant available to him. And at least for Levick, he has an answer to this Edwin. Yeah, and at least is maybe a little understatement, I feel. This is made the game wide open again. Well, that backstab's pretty tasty. Yep. Prior to that draw, I was thinking Secret Dagger into Secret Miscreant, although very slow, is Bunny Hopper's best expenditure of mana. But now he can make sure the board still remains intact for him, keep the tempo, and also go wide and not get blown out too hard by Ratna's Jake. Obviously, he should have gone for the bigger Edwin, Jia. <laughs> he of knew course. he was going to get backstab, he may have done. And um, then it would just be a bigger shadow or death on the other side, huh? Yeah, most likely. Absolutely. But this is plenty. This is all the rogue wants to be doing. is just slowly grinding you down uh, and getting you annoying. <laughs> I mean, that is obviously a downgrade in this specific situation where Levick has a three damage answer. But if that stuck around, that would have been pretty funny. It yeah, could I mean, have been an 8-8 eight, eight Edwin or something. People who actually chose to play that in their deck for a while. Wasn't that actually Bunny Hopper and Viper and Casey oh, that one week? it was. Well, Karma. In... Yeah. <laughs> oh, we're getting thank you from Abar. I don't mind shouting out Abar, uh, letting us know that it was indeed those people. Well, Levick 
thankfully for him, has had a pretty efficient answer. He's also just going to get that Desert Spear down, start threatening a possibility for Faceless and Varanus. Even though it's not there, the Desert Spear is just a really nice complement to Rotness Drake. So you have a weapon that deals with the small minions, get them out of the way so you can uh, vomit all over the big minion. That is, though, requiring Levick to draw a dragon in the near future. Yeah, we are going to get that weird standoff of can my lots of rubbish beat your one or two really big things? And I feel like Bunny Hopper might need a little bit more rubbish to keep up in this race at the moment. Indeed. And he can discover his way into a bit more rubbish or a legendary minion. To be fair, there are a lot of rubbish legendaries. But when you discover, you do get a top, roughly speaking, a top 20% card. So you get a top 20% legendary. Oh, uh, Lorinda stats in real time. This is amazing. That's something I worked out as soon as Discover came out. I can't remember the exact number, but it's somewhere between 15 and 25%. Um, just how powerful Discover is. Obviously, I can't list you all the legendaries in order, but I can list numbers from 1 to how many legendaries there are, so you're going to get numbers 1 to 17 or whatever this often. I just want to take this time to genuinely express my gratitude for you, Lorinda, on behalf of all the other casters. You do these things because they're fun, but they're probably fun for no one else, so we're so thankful <laughs> we have you. <laughs> you know, that's something that never really occurred to me, is that most people just don't find all that nonsense fun. Yeah, it's nice to have and appreciate that, Gia. Thank you. Ah. Uh... Well, that was a very clutch draw for Levick to find a... Uh, not only scavengers but also to get six or because i guess even though the diving griffin would have still ended up a six one after this board state i think the four four is definitely much more durable and uh, he's just trying to set up the cleanest board possible for the dino tamer brand and that draw very much has achieved it in the immediate and as a player who struggles a little with rogue i felt this game has kind of played itself for bunny hopper up to this mm. point and has suddenly become completely impossible to understand what's going on. He has got so many choices right now, including when to play this Dragon's Horde. Indeed, and obviously he knows that either Siamat or Dinotaber Bran is going to be a very, very punishing option for Levick on the next turn, mm -hmm. but he just doesn't have any board states that line up well against either of them because there is this 4-4 remaining. The Cartooth Defender gets value traded, the Desert Spear Charge deals with the second half, and then Bran can still go face. So um, he's opting for the Shield of Galakon instead. Wow, the name of that just escaped me for a few seconds. And gets, I would say, the best lackey in the situation, which is just go wide and give yourself the best shot of clearing the King Crush should it come down this turn. And it will. I always think of Sotl. It's not going to happen here, I don't think, but Sotl's Dino Trader brand whenever it has to trade. He likes to have a little poke at Raven and he's hugged away. And there we go again. Dino Trader. Uh, on board control stream, he calls it King Rush. That's also <laughs> the other acceptable nomenclature for a trading King Crush. It's worth noting, though, that it didn't necessarily have to trade there. We could have seen Levick trade in his Zixor instead and the last charge of the Desert hmm. Spear, but that would have left him without the Zixar on board, and also a 2-3 on the other side. So I think this is very disciplined from Levick to actually take that trade and recognize that this wide board is more problematic for Rogue to deal with, whereas if it's just a Brand and King Crush, he can, uh, Bunny Hopper can put together a Blackjack Stunner clear. Just pick up the Natalie to buy a little bit of time if he's still alive. It's an iffy proposition, but he does at least manage to get down that questing adventurer could die on board. But with the pickup of a dragon, yet another absolutely disgusting Rottnest Drake turn. How do you feel about the frizz in these decks? I always feel it's just not good enough, but it's slowly but surely gaining traction, which is often a sign that playtesting says otherwise. At first glance, it looks like a way to compensate for the nerf on Dragon Queen Alex Straza, but the way it fits into the deck on the four cost slot, I suppose, is a pretty decent argument because a lot of the time you're playing Bone Wraith in that slot, which is that doesn't feel like a card that Highlander Hunter wants to do on curve, right? It's a defensive card. But um, Frizz Kindle Roost, I think, has to be 
in very, very specific situations where you can play that and feel safe about your tempo. So I'm still on the fence about it. Cool. Fence is sometimes a good position. I think the more I look at it, I mean, the deck plays the most numbers it can for the first six turns. And it is a 5-4. Right. Like, forgetting the fact it does something. Just a 5-4 is a decent numbers card. If it did nothing, you'd probably play Yeti instead. But even so, it doesn't do nothing. It does do something. Sure. It's just like Fey Wing in terms of the stats, so that's something going for it. But what is going for Bunny Hopper is close to nothing. I would say even if he develops this cartoon, he knows the King Rush is in hand, and it's probably going to be an actual bona fide King Crush on the following turn. Mm. And if he tries to develop anything other than a taunt, he's just dead. So it's gonna have to be Kartut stall into, I guess, top deck Galakron prayer. And that seems to be what he's going with. A good chance of a game number. A good chance. It looks like we're going into a game number five. This is interesting, though. I mean, the King Crush is not lethal this turn, and you really want to get value off of that Dragon Bane hero power. So I like that Levix holding off on it here. Any target, honestly, is a good one. Yeah, he's just going to put the game completely out of sight here. Most of the time, you can ignore Natalie if he can just make sure quickly in his brain he doesn't think he can take 16 off-board damage. Yeah. Well, if he sends it all face, literally the only thing he has to worry about is Galakron into Kronks, specifically. Yeah, and the nerfs are important here as well. Give me a quest. Bunny Hopper trying to get a taunt lackey, I suppose, and put together a relatively decent sized questing adventure. Doesn't get it though, looking for any other outs. Yeah, and Daring Escape Concede. Love it. The new prep coin concede. <laughs> Just, I mean, okay, it's I'm on, taking it's my minions on, and I'm going home. Exactly. It's on the card text is escape. <laughs> Can generate uh, a taunt that is not nearly going to be big enough. He can rush that and kill it off and put the prime in his deck for fun. Bunny, you know he has a King Crush. <laughs> Please, just one time, let us live. Honestly, you can treat these little situations like a mini game, which is, can you think of the out Bunny Hopper is thinking of? Because he doesn't mm -hmm. do these things for no reason. Oh, he absolutely. was probably still thinking of a particular out there, but I just couldn't imagine anything when he only had two mana left at that point. Yeah, even playing a lot of Warrior, I have the same thing sometimes. You, like, you go for your dragon and you miss the dragon that's going to give you taunt because it's mm -hmm. a long shot. And then you have to work out whether to kill this minion. It's just, how am I going to get another lackey? What's that going to do? And the ordering's really important when you're going for that sort of one in a million out. Mm. You, you do have to know what you're trying to get. And you do get used to it as well over time. But game at number five is a massive game for Levick. He's five and one. Remember, Bunny is six and oh already. Right. And it is going to be that control Eddie Demon Hunter. And the fortunate or unfortunate, depending on what side you are on, uh, effect of the down pairing is something that's pretty common in Swiss. Sometimes you won't have a nice even split of everybody on the same relative amounts of the same match score. So as you said, Levick has so much to gain from this because of Bunny Hopper's amazing tiebreakers, whereas if Bunny Hopper loses, it's very bad for his tiebreakers. But mm -hmm. this final matchup is coming down to, I would say, a pretty good spot for Bunny Hopper. Um, just looking at Highlander Hunter as a concept, it is a deck that is good at uh, being anti-control and preying upon uh, these decks that want to deal with multiple small minions and not necessarily one big one. That is to say, though, uh, that's not to say, though, that Demon Hunter doesn't have the stuff to get there against the Highlander Hunter, especially since um, the healing is very abundant in the case of this deck. Yeah, it's just going to be up against the Rogue, but it's just, a lot of that applies um, with... Uh... The Magtherodon, etc. Just being able to not do damage ever. 
Sorry, I my brain just completely died there, and it's not even a weird time zone for me. I thought that was Hunter, but okay. Resetting versus Rogue, I do think Demon Hunter is in an awesome spot. Um, <laughs> they just don't have a good way of dealing with multiple weapon swings to the face. They don't have a good way of dealing with that. They do have a good way of um, just killing you first, but the control Demon Hunter is pretty good at keeping I wide boards clear. Again. Right. Um, and but Bunny Hopper's chance is to make multiple white boards. And when you first mentioned killing you quickly, I wasn't thinking necessarily of white boards, but rather Edwins and Questing Adventure. Mm -hmm. But even for those cards, this Demon Hunter has a check because, as you can see there, Levick has that Consume Magic in hand uh, mm -hmm. available as an emergency switch if he needs it. Yeah, I am amazed how good this Consume Magic has been so far when we've seen this deck. Uh, it feels like an almost useless card when you sort of play it on ladder. But tournament decks are, are very similar. But there's always one card you need to get rid of. There's a lot of one card swing cards at the moment. If you consume those magics on that, it's got end games very quickly for you. So Levick there actually decides to kill off the first half of the Temple Enforcer, which you know, makes me think that he wants to swing into it again on the following turn. I'm pretty surprised by the use of that Aldraki oh, Warblade so gosh. soon. I feel like he was fine to leave the 1-2 on board, knowing it's quite unlikely for Bunny Hopper to actually be able to damage his own uh, Temple Berserker and get the Enrage. I wouldn't have minded Levick just going for hero power and maybe uh, damaging the Pharaoh Cat a little bit, or if he was going to equip the Warblades, kill the Pharaoh Cat instead. I wonder if there's a little bit of um, some sort of mind games going on there, because to me, that told Bunny Hopper there was no Immolation Aura in hand. Huh. And I'd have been very tempted in Bunny's position just to play all three one drops there and say, look, you haven't got Immolation Aura, deal with this, good luck. But I'm so wondering if Bunny Hopper took it as a bluff. I'm not sure if he could have had the read on... Um, no immolation in hand because if you deal with the first half of the temple berserker then you can still set up for an immolation on the second turn yeah that's that's yeah you can just curious to me yeah. um the pick from levick was also pretty interesting the i beam probably gonna lose its outcast value on the following turn. I was eyeing, honestly, the coordinated strike, uh, but I suppose since he was already dealing with the Temple Berserker that turn, it wouldn't necessarily have good targets other than the Pharaoh Cat on the follow-up. But this has just been a very awkward draw for Bunny Hopper. Um, no good uh, ways to fill out his curve, no invoke so far, and no secrets to even try and cheese out a Dirty Secrets card draw. Yeah, I feel like Levick's just collecting as much removal as possible now with that I-beam. Three mana I-beam's fine. That's I something that sometimes see. gets lost in the shuffle a little bit. Sure. Um, yeah, you miss your turn, but quite often it's just kill your one thing, miss my turn. We're, we're back where we were, but I've advanced my game plan towards winning the game by just surviving that extra one turn. Okay, there's the dirty trick, so Bunny Hopper can almost certainly get value off of that because Levick is just going to play spells at some point to advance his game plan. However, Bunny Hopper has not drawn into any lackey generators and he really wants to get his Togwaggle online. So from this point, I think he feels already pretty behind. Mm-hmm. And uh, so far as to bounce his own Pharaoh Cat to give himself another shot at a Reborn minion that's playable on curve next turn. Uh, Cartooth would be a pretty good one. Okay. That's <laughs> good a call. six mana use. <laughs> yeah. Levick's got me feeling really good about this. I'm seeing Bunny Hopper sure. having to make that. And Bunny Hopper knows that there aren't really any targets he wants to stun back into the hand outside of exactly Magtheridon. But the dirty tricks does pick him up, Galakrond and an Invoke spell, so that is at least some measure of threats going on. Not immediately though, because he doesn't have targets. Yeah, and he hasn't really got 
by the nature of this deck, he hasn't really got any way of capitalizing on the fact he's finally got things in his favor. So, so he's going to have to sit back and wait for Bunny Hopper to come at him yet again. And that can be a problem, especially how is he going to get this skull into use? He really wants to get that going, but it's right going to be in the middle of the hand next to him. Well, you mentioned I-Beam is still a playable card at 3 mana. I guess Skull is technically still a playable card at 6 mana. Uh, and without mm. the outcast, I mean... Uh, it is looking very awkward though, so I wouldn't mind Levick just getting the meta online. Shoot off the first half of the card to it. Now I am yeah, that's the other issue. He's never touching this consume magic until Edwin happens or questing happens. That's just gonna right. be his safety net forever. I mean, Lovic just has three eyes, three eye beams, and none of them can see. <laughs> oh man! <laughs> Seal fate your own face. That can't I, be right. <laughs> I knew that was gonna come up, and I hate it every time it's mentioned. But maybe, no, it's just mm. never right. I it's mean, just never right. There's an argument for it. To get the Lackey and get the Togwaggle online for the next turn, it's just so ugly. Yeah, and I think because of that, that line of reasoning takes you to, if I'm going to do that, I might as well just play Galapond. And it's a bit slower to get them online, but at least that's my Lackey's generated and I can keep my seal fate for, for other things. Very fair point. And uh, he knows that since he only had that one invoked, he was very unlikely to get more Galakron value in the near future. And at least picks up a pretty good discount target for his trouble. Yeah, and I wonder when Levick's going to decide to do some healing. He's fine on 17, but Demons. this can go wrong for him quite Demons. quickly now. Because he has no idea what's in Bunny Hopper's hand. I can see his hand, and I've got no idea what's in it, the way it's been played. The good thing for Lovick, though, is that Bunny Hopper's list does not have room for Eviscerate to fit in the whole secret package on top of the Galakron package. So Lovick knows that the damage coming at him is largely going to be from minions, and he does have all his bases covered for minion removal. Just all he could possibly wish for. But Bunny Hopper, I guess, with the Galakron active and a lackey generated every turn if he wants it, can start fishing for some additional burst off of Ethereal Lackeys and Cobalt Lackeys. That last turn was insane. He's got Blood Mage Thanos in hand. It was still just seven mana pass. <laughs> like, the restraint there to not play a Thanos, at least, just to try and get through your deck. Obviously, I understand. It, it's, it's more useful. It, it, it interacts well with your hand. But that is some restraint there. And look at the reward he's yeah. going to get from doing it. He can kill these five health minions now. Yep very very easily Donald's Chaos Nova and it is getting to the point where if we think about what Levick really wants to draw um, I would wager it's in the realm of the Warglaves you can think about Magtheridon, Magtheridon of course but he knows that Flick is available that um, the second Blackjack Center is still there so he can't necessarily rely on Magtheridon's swing as a win condition it might be that he's even not rushing to draw cards if he sees this going to fatigue. Give me a quest. Yeah, I mean, we, we saw yesterday that even 4-4 four, four lackeys in the right conditions don't get it done. So, mm. <laughs> despite the fact the rogue has infinite value, it doesn't have infinite time to convert that value into a win. Right. So maybe he is just being a little bit careful. And because of the start Levick had, which is um, no twin slice, no warglaves, and Bunny Hopper is at a very healthy 35, I don't think Levick sees his win condition as a bunch of weapon swings to face right now. Rather, it's to remove everything that Bunny Hopper, Hopper has to offer. And at the moment, it's going to be the first questing committed. Possibly and alongside Edwin. Yeah, it's up to when the Bunny thinks that... I don't know, Blade Dance is one heck of a card. It really is. I think it would be a stretch to say that the blade dance damage can get up to 12 uh, <laughs> without a lot of resources used. I'm not sure how big this Edwin is. It's gonna, it's be, gonna be big. Well out of range. You're backstabbing your own minions. You know the Edwin's gonna be huge. A 
healthy 1616 dealt with immediately by consume magic because no mage spells were played. Levick did not have to test for any measure of counter spell. But the way that Bunny Hopper did it played around consume magic the best he could, which is wait until he could do both in one turn. Right. So you can't consume them both, and now Levick has to do something he's planned for a while, which is start using these I beams. Remember, he took an I beam forever ago now that looked like it did nothing. Well, this is what it does. It kills questing adventurers seven turns later. Patience rewarded. However, there's other targets that he wants to remove, namely the Hanar, could just give Bunny Hopper a lot of value that Levick does not really want to deal with. I don't think he minds leaving up that uh, ambush minion more not necessarily um, his most valuable minion. However, between killing a 2-2 and a 2-3, math just says if you have the mana, you kill the 2-3. It says that, but Shadow Step's a card. Right. And Edwin is so terrifying that the prospect of it getting Shadow Stepped and coming back as another, however ridiculous that was, 16-16, sometimes math doesn't work. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. The Kronk's top deck for Bunny Hopper is pretty big because he just saw Levick unload tons of resources to deal with these two big threats. And now he can follow up the threat chain with the Kronk's into the 8-8 eight, eight taunt and uh, just hope that he's run Levick out of answers at that point. Um, as far as Kronk's other effects, I feel like the 8-8 eight, eight gets him the most value in this matchup. You're not really looking to push for the first lethal until you've gotten minion damage to begin with. Is there any way that Bunny Hopper can maybe try and set up for the plus two plus two on some of his not so good minions? Mm -hmm. So build a board to a medium size and then make it to a huge board and survive. So, um, if you're buffing a bunch of smaller minions, I'd assume those are lackeys, and even if they get the plus two plus two buff, it still falls prey to second Chaos Nova into Blade Dance. So, might not be my first line of thinking, but the argument for not playing Kronks here is, well, you get to play the Flick and remove both the Moarg, which also greatly limits what Levick can do with his AoE. So this might play into what you were saying of uh, limiting his removal options and going for the wide board instead. Hmm. Levick, slowly but surely running out of those options. This Blade Dance takes care of this board, but Bunny Hopper with a full hand will be Something that Levick just doesn't want to blade dance. No matter how good it looks. And it's huge also that he has to expend two charges of the Warglaze to deal with this because that's eight damage that's not being sent to Bunny Hopper's face across multiple turns. And Bunny Hopper, this is the first damage he's taken all game. Wow. Yeah, we were talking about him seal fading his own face forever ago now, and he still yeah. has that seal fate, and he still has that face. <laughs> seal face. And this is the problem. Well, the problem, this is one of the awkward things about this. Um, this deck is that he, even, he had that turn on turn seven where he just did nothing. And that's a turn where if you're a control deck and you've got in front, you don't want to do nothing. You want to put your... Right. Just a Yeti on the board, something, mm -hmm. just to fight back. Yeah, it's a very good point. He's not had any way to capitalize off of the efficient board clears he's had because the only threat in the deck is Magtheridon, and the rest of the damage comes from weapons. And in my head, I was as I was picturing this matchup, I thought that the Warglaves would be able to go face uh, turn after turn, but they were kind of low in the deck, and it's gotten to the point where Levick might even be hesitant to play these Skulls because he might be thinking about fatigue as his main win condition now. And now he needs to also be incredibly careful because Spellbender, just from out of the blue, from something that's generated some point in history in Bunny Hopper time, can actually just catch Levick out here. It's a big one. Okay, that Skull played is very relevant, picks up his second Warglaze and also the active Zephyrus. And if Levick wants to make some threat out of his remaining cards, Zephyrus is going to have to play a huge part in that. If you just go for something like Tyrion, though, it's very likely going to get stunned back into the hand. Hmm. So, curious to see how he will 
use that Zephyrus value, but um, we could still see him go for a pace game plan, having picked up the second war waves. Mm -hmm. And uh, Volpera fish him some more damage. Yeah, and he needs it urgently, but does he need it immediately? I mean, urgently in the next six turns, <laughs> he's got to find. He needs it by the end of the game, otherwise he's not going to have enough damage. But he doesn't necessarily need it straight away. Curious to see what he put on top. I think the graphic showed immolation aura there. Okay. Which so he's I'm still a on bit the kill them all. By. Yeah. I mean, he has Blade Dance, but maybe he's thinking it needs to be supported by additional clearing. Yeah, with Bunny down to five cards, plus as many lackeys as he can hero power into. But he's making sure not to miss that, because right. he's aware of what's going on here. Nothing but power. But at some point, you feel that Bunny Hop is just going to generate a dragon, and that's going to be too much. Right. Bunny has missed the Draconic Lackey so far, but he does pick up a spell that gives him more value. going to hold off on it and I suppose just play down another Titanic. It's not a very good Lackey in these situations, but it's still one damage every turn that Levick might feel inclined to clear. I'll go for Witchy instead, get a 2-drop. Okay, That gets armor, not... Insignificant. Mm -hmm. Still has that Kronks waiting as well for the right moment. No hurry to decide what he's going to do with it. He'll just do the right thing with it when the time comes up. And the ice barrier that he generated is also pretty relevant because that uh, as soon as Lovick sees it, impressed. he probably realizes that just the one Warglaves is very unlikely to deal lethal damage even across many turns. Gets the I-beam nicely done there through the Spellbender. Another banana skin avoided. Levitt really showing off, whatever the result turns out being here, showing off how good he is at this game, in this match. So, going for these spells to put himself on 5 mana and give him an Edwin, I suppose? <laughs> How Unless he wants like? this infiltrate, or I don't know. <laughs> Probably has a solid read on Ice Barrier, but I feel like the Edwin should be a higher priority to at least give him a threat at this point. But she disagrees. So for the Edwin to do, let's say the Edwin was 10 10, I did lose track, might have been 8 8. Me too. Um, for Edwin to do 8 damage, you would have to have hit face once. This has done 8 damage just by being played. Right, but the one time 8 damage is not enough because Bunny Hopper sure. still has a lot of health. And you can make the argument that the Edwin probably gets Blackjack stunned, but then maybe the Magtheridon can come down safely later on mm -hmm. if that happens. Huh. No, that's fair. If you feel that doing the 8 damage once isn't enough, then absolutely. So Levick's going to try and show us that 8 damage once is enough. Let's see if he can get that done. I'm with you, I think, but... Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it seems like he was possibly going for Doomhammer off of Zephyrus, but didn't actually get offered that. And I suppose uh, Zephyrus has to detect a slightly lower health total on the other side to give Doomhammer without any minions for it to trade into. And the Doomhammer would have just been another 16 damage across many turns, but it does make sense for most raw damage available. Yeah, interesting. So the way it worked out was it just found those three, because of the secret, it found three better options. This last Warglaves technically also represents a Doomhammer's mm. worth of damage <laughs> throughout mm. four turns. But does Levick have four turns? He knows Kronks is available. He knows Kronks can deal the five life steal, or it can also just buff this large board. Yeah, Doomhammer plus this does two Doomhammers worth of damage, so it does make sense that he'd want it. But he's starting to get that damage done now. It's just 
difficult to imagine a world where he has actually eight turns to get all charges off Doomhammer and all charges off the war mm. games. Um, also very fair. But you can see where his head is at, which is he just needs to generate more um, damage death. somehow because it's just not getting there. But it feels like what Levick has been going for has been very wishy-washy. You see him going for damage, but then he sinks a charge into a 3-1. And then he knows that he doesn't have enough raw damage available to deal the 18. And so that makes me think his game plan is now Magtheridon. Yeah, I think that's been his plan every time. I think that's why it looks wishy-washy, of course. The plan has to be not too pessimistic. It has to be, hey, Magtherodon's coming soon because there's not many cards left in my deck. So every time it doesn't come, it makes your plan look a bit stupid. And now we're down to the bottom four cards. It still hasn't turned up. The plan looks even worse. <laughs> that's oh, pretty wow. good for Bunny Hopper. I don't think Bunny Hopper needs to play any spells at this point. Maybe Clever Disguise, but not till he's actually fatiguing. Yeah. And that means Levick's own card draw and Blade Dances can be used against him. Yeah, and there's still that bounced back Kronks ready to just win the game at any moment now. Mm -hmm. Going for the Mystery Choice and a Prayer. So Work Blade Dance now. twice is a clear. I mean, technically just once with hero power, but I feel like any weapon charge that doesn't go face mm -hmm. is being wasted. However, that logic only made sense a while ago when Levick had more charges off his weapon. Right now, as it stands, the damage just does not add up. Yeah, it feels like he's tried to fatigue Bunny Hopper, but Bunny Hopper's just sidestepped it and actually just turned it around. Right. And it's felt like that for a while, to be honest. And you can't do that with Rogue. Um, even him taking the Wondrous Wand was, you know, balanced out by Levick playing the Skull, and he kind of had to to respond to that immediate board. But since Bunny Hopper had his early Galakron, managed to hero power every turn, and now he has a Draconic Lackey available, the fatigue game plan just doesn't get there. And I feel like there were some windows where Levick maybe could have recognized that, especially when he was trying to go for what we presume is Doomhammer and send all that damage face. But after he did not get that option, it seems like um, he's just been grasping at straws for a way to win the game at this point. Yeah, and they're just, it's just not there now. Bunny Hopper's going to Bunny Hopper Levick to death. And... Oh, behave! Have a shadow step. On the wings of there it is, Draconic Lackey that we've been waiting for forever to speed mm -hmm. things along. Smack third on bottom two cards. <laughs> kind of a cruel joke at this point, but even mm. if that comes into play, Bunny Hopper has been holding on to that. Blackjack Stunner this entire game to make sure that he has a check for it. Uh, demons. So Chaos Strike Magtherodon, best blade dance ever. <laughs> and then Bunny Hopper forgets to stun of it. What could go wrong? I mean, maybe Levick is hoping that the second stunner is in the bottom two for Bunny Hopper and he can actually force Bunny to overdraw it because <laughs> of the choke. <laughs> Go, Blade Dance, you got this. All on the right. Let's go. <laughs> what? I get <gets> what? it! <laughs> Doesn't even need the weapon point. charge, which is safe in case he only hit two. What? <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is top five moments. I don't care if it's not the regular GM season. Derek needs to make a video about this. Of course, it's not going to get there because Bunny Hopper has an answer, but that was just so highlight worthy. I can't, I can't believe what I saw. That was actually ridiculous. <laughs> give me the odds on that, Lorinda. Uh, Give me a moment. One in 28, something like that. I don't know. I actually don't know. That's just a guess off the top of my head, but it sounds right. <laughs> Twenty-one, twenty-eight, something like that. Yeah, he didn't actually even need an answer from Hexerodon when Bunny Hopper can just deal the lethal. But that was so funny. <laughs> Best yeah, thing I've seen all tournament. 
Yes. So, so Bunny Hopper does Bunny Hopper Levick into submission after a long, long grindy last game. Um, but Levick's still on five and two, still in a good position. And I think we saw from the way that he was playing, like grinding there at least, that he's up for this challenge. Bunny Hopper basically in the top eight. We can't call it yet. Tiebreakers are sometimes weird. Mm -hmm. But one of the best players in the world, Bunny Hopper, came so close, of course, to getting to the World Championships. Maybe this is his way of um, getting some retribution. Indeed. 7-0 and for Bunny Hopper. And with the amount of Masters tours we've had so far and Bunny Hopper playing every single one of them, if you were to ask me who's a name that I'd be shocked we haven't seen in top 8 yet, and I don't think we have seen Bunny Hopper, he would be at the top of my list. We've seen a bunch of GMs uh, and um, new GMs also winning Masters tours, making the top 8s. Bunny Hopper has always had pretty consistent positive results, but this could be very well his first venture into the top 8 stages of a huge tournament. And that is, I guess, returning to his roots because, of course, this was a player that was there since very early Hearthstone and excelling in no matter what format uh, tournaments are held in these days. Yeah, he has had a lot of sort of six and threes. He's in the top 15 for most Masters Tour match wins. So I was asking, like, who's going to come out of the pack and try and challenge Dead Draw? Well, maybe Bunny Hopper's going to give that a go. Although I think Dead Draw's still in there plugging away, trying to get that seven and two to overtake uh, Pinyas on the standings. But anyway, that is the main part of round seven done. But I think there's still some more to go. So we're going to take a short break and come back with some extra content from round seven in just a moment. 